Um, well, as many people are aware, but probably just as many people aren't aware, the island of Jersey doubles in size when the tide goes out twice each day. Unsurprisingly, the other half of Jersey, that area that is exposed at low tide, is very much a part of Jersey life. It's incredibly rich, a fantastic uh, variety of seaweeds, mollusks, fish, crustaceans to be found while you're out there. And it's a sad fact that it's often been the case that people have become preoccupied with finding dinner or enjoying themselves out there and not realise the tide was on its way behind them because it's drummed into us from day one at school that the tides in Jersey are something to be respected and feared, no doubt about it. It's accepted amongst Jersey people, amongst us locals, that tide tables are a fact of life. Not everybody knows that. Um, the Jersey Evening Post publish them every night, they're on the television. Um, you'll hear the high tide and low tide on the radio every morning and every evening. So it's a rhythm that we all live by. But if you visit the island, it's one that it's absolutely fundamental to understand before you venture out onto our beaches. If you are a visitor to the island, it's absolutely vital that you are fully prepared before you go out there. Take a local guide is one very, very useful piece of advice. It's not widely understood, but when the tide floods, it doesn't flood at an equal rate throughout the tide. We have something here called the Rule of Twelfths. For the first hour of the flood tide, things move very, very gently. The next hour, things are much, much more rapid. The middle two hours of the flood, the tide can rise at an alarming rate. With a good strong wind behind the flood tide, in the corner of the Bay de Mont Saint Michel down here, you can see upwards of four centimeters of vertical rise in a minute. Five centimeters, quite possible. So your Wellington boots will be on dry sand one minute, and in less than 10 minutes, you will have full Wellington boots. It's that fast. It's no great surprise that people from Jersey have been visiting the seashores, the extensive seashores around the island for centuries and centuries. For many years it was a dangerous place out there with no refuge other than the tower. In recent years um, a very very bright idea saw that the installation of a tower out there would be essentially a refuge saving lives into the future. It's a very, very wise thing to do to make note of the position of the refuge on your way out. When you're out at the tower and you're looking back at dry land, the refuge will tend to blend in to the surroundings. On the way out, against the horizon, it's much, much easier to pick out. Be aware of its position. It's in the most helpful place. Uh, the refuge is, of course, your final point of safety. You can make it all the way back from Seymour Tower almost to dry land without realizing that you're cut off. That final gully, the one where the refuge is, is often the fastest running, deepest gully you have to cross. We're getting a bit surrounded now, I think. But I think we'll be okay for a little while longer. It's a logical fact that the refuge, your last point of safety on the return home, is in a sensible place. The most direct route from the tower to Seymour Slipway, opposite the pub, if you want to get back and enjoy a drink afterwards, you will find that refuge. It's right there for a very, very simple reason. Oh, but I'm scared of him. What, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to climb this ladder and wave. Nobody else has seen well, No one's going to see us, are they? just before the tide floods in and basically cuts you off in a pincer movement. The tide will come from north and south on the flood and the refuge is in the very, very best place. That refuge is very, very carefully watched, not only by the rescue services as you would expect, but by the local population. It's almost a national sport in Brewville keeping an eye on that crow's nest with a pair of binoculars to see which unfortunate from the other side of the island or visiting the island might have been silly enough to get cut off. I can't see anybody coming. No, I can't yet. There's a lifeboat coming out. That wind is getting out. It's 
a long way up here, isn't it? Oh, I hope somebody comes to save us. Sir? Yeah? Looks as though somebody may be cut off at the rescue tower. Hello, Kenny, are you there? You might have to get your kayak out. I see there's a couple stuck out there at the refuge beacon. Oh yes, I've seen that, Richard, yes, though. Yeah, yeah oh, okay then. You'll be all at, in control. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they'll definitely cut off. I'll have to go. Okay. Can you phone the rescue service? In the meantime, I'll get the kayak and I'll shoot out just in case uh, the rescue service don't get there in time. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the problem with uh, being out there uh, is when you're out sort of walking back from the tower to, towards shore, if, if you're wandering back, sort of just sort of enjoying the day, uh, and you, you don't realise that the, the tide has actually come in both sides uh, through the gullies, uh, which are quite quite deep channels. Uh, it's quite often what has happened is people have come through the first gully thinking, oh, that's us, we're safe, we can, we can get back to dry land, not realising there's another gully further, further in towards shore, which is even wider and deeper than the previous gully they've come through. And it can race in quite quickly, especially when it's a spring tide or a, a high tide. Uh, it comes in from both sides and you don't actually realise uh, what, what is actually happening. <laughs> rescue we, uh, we, we seen, I took part in a couple of young lads that had newly sort of came to the island. They were actually stuck out in the rocks and that was, they were the first time I actually rescued somebody on the kayak. Uh, they, I think they were sort of probably a good couple of hundred yards out, but one of them couldn't swim. I managed to bring, bring both of them back uh, and they, they were uh, obviously very thankful. If you're out there at low tide, basically you have roughly an hour, a cushion of an hour between low tide and when you need to be heading back. You can get across as late as two and a half, two and three quarter hours after low tide, but that is not recommended. You will have white knuckles and it will be touch and go. One hour after low tide, leave the tower, safety margin included. Twisted ankles, anything along those lines, Decreased visibility can come down in moments. Always leave yourself a cushion. Here at the Coast Guard uh, Sea Rescue Centre, uh, we're, we're available 24 hours a day to coordinate uh, rescues at sea. Um, if you go down, uh, following the tide down to low water in the Seymour area, a few important things to remember. If you don't know what the tide tables actually, the information given actually means, ask a local to interpret them for you. Um, it gives you all the details you need to know to make a safe trip. Make sure you tell somebody where you're going. If you're staying in a guest house or hotel, just make sure that they, somebody knows that you're going for a walk down in that direction. Um, take a mobile phone with you. Uh, we're Coast Guard 999 call would uh, get help to you very quickly if you find yourself surrounded. We're open 24 hours a day to, to help you if you get into trouble. Don't become a headline in the local newspaper. It's much better that we get you before that.